He, a man who was by right an enemy, and yet he's brought in, and he's sat down at the table, and he receives the blessing of David. And we're going to read a parable that the Lord Jesus Christ taught in, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 14. And this is about another man that has set a table. This man has set a table, and at his table, there are going to sit people that are lame. And not only people that are lame, but people that are blind and halt and maimed. These are the kind of individuals that this great man who has pre prepared this great feast is going to bring in and sit at his table and enjoy his presence and enjoy the blessings that he has for them. And so we read the parable in uh, Luke chapter 14 and we start reading in verse 16. It says, then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking. He says, a certain man gave a great supper and he invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. And the first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground that I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you, that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. And we know that God always blesses his word to our hearts this afternoon. So here's another man. A man who has made a great provision. No doubt at tremendous expense. And here he is, and he's got the, to the position, he's got to the stage where everything is just as he wants it to be. Everything is completely done and ready. Everything is to his satisfaction. Perhaps as he looks over the, the, the table as it is set, and he sees the food sitting there, and he sees the, the place settings, and, and everything is ready. And he's gone to a great deal of effort and a great deal of expense to, uh, to, to provide this feast. And, and as the feast comes to uh, be at that stage where it's ready to be distributed, the invitation goes out, out to the people, come for all things are now ready. You know, back in these days when a, a, an individual would pre prepare a feast, you know, the invitation would be given in advance as to when the feast was going to be. And they would let them know that uh, the date that it was going to be, but the exact time wasn't set until the day of the feast itself, until the person that was holding the feast was content that everything was ready, that everything was just the way they would like it to be. And so these people that were invited had been invited in advance of this. And perhaps their initial response to that invitation had been, yes, I'd love to come along. I'd love to share in the provision that you're making. I'd love to enjoy the blessings that you're providing. And in advance of that uh, feast being ready, perhaps these people's hearts were, were, were waiting in anticipation of the moment when, when the time would be decided that everything was ready and everything was prepared. And that time comes. And the word comes through the servants. Everything's prepared. Everything's done. Everything's ready. Come. Come. For all things are now ready. You know, this is really a picture to us this afternoon. This is a picture to us of God. This is a picture to us of God who has made a great preparation for us. A God who has gone to a great deal of effort. To make that preparation. A God who has gone to a great deal of expense to get to the point when he can say to you and I, Come, for all things are now ready. Come, for everything is just the way it should be. Come, because everything is to my satisfaction. Everything is ready. Everything is ready. It was at a stage where 
Everything was done. You know, that reminds me of words spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> words that the Lord Jesus Christ would cry in his final moments before he would die. Perhaps words that he's familiar with, words that he's heard quoted. Words of completion. Words of satisfaction. As the Lord Jesus Christ, before he closes his eyes in death, the Lord Jesus Christ will cry out, It is finished. It's finished. The work of salvation is secured because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Jesus has borne the punishment for your sin and mine on his own body on the tree. Everything that God had asked him to do, he had fulfilled it. The very purpose for which he had come was to do the will of his Father. And he accomplished that will in its totality as he hung on the cross. And as sin was poured out on him, the punishment for our sins was poured out on him. And Jesus cries with a cry of victory. And we've spoken on this verse not too long ago. Jesus cries with a cry of victory. It's finished. It's done. It's paid in full. I'm satisfied with what I've done. God is satisfied with what I've done. And the invitation goes out this afternoon as I went out to these men in this day. Come. For everything is ready. Full provision has been made. And I want to say to you this afternoon, the invitation that God extends to you this afternoon, the invitation to come to him today is on, is on the basis that everything is ready. Everything has been done in order to make it possible for you to come to God. See, we can't come to God any way we want. We can't come to God willy-nilly as it were and just expect to have an audience with God the way we are. The Bible reminds us of that which separates us from God. That which has created a divide between us and God. That which has broken the relationship between us and God is sin. And sin acts as a barrier between us and God. And the only way in which we can know God, the only way in which we can have a right relationship with God, is if sin is dealt with, is if sin is forgiven, is if sin is cleansed, is if sin is removed, and that barrier is taken away. And that is what Jesus did on the cross. That's what Jesus was making a claim of victory over as he hung on the cross and he declared with absolute authority, it's finished, it's done, it's paid in full. And because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross this afternoon, in order to deal with your sin and my sin, in order to make it possible for that sin to be removed and cleansed and washed away, because of what he has done, the invitation from God goes out to our hearts this afternoon. Come, for all things are now ready. Come, everything has been prepared. Come, the work has been done. Isn't it amazing that God is not wanting us to come to him on any other term and on any other basis than what he has already accomplished on our behalf? I was just thinking of this in a natural uh, sphere earlier on today. You know, you think of someone who gives you an invitation along for dinner. You know, your expectation when you arrive there is that, that they're the ones that are going to provide the food, aren't it? Oh, I know out of courtesy, you know, we quite often take along a wee binding, don't we? Something to show our appreciation to the person that is hosting us and the, the person who has gone to the effort of providing for us. But, but the expectation is that you're going there to enjoy what they've done for you, to enjoy what they've provided for you, to enjoy the effort that they've put in for you, to enjoy the expense that they have shown to you. The expectation is not that you go along there and you roll up your sleeves and you go on your penny and you get into the kitchen and you start doing it yourself. The expectation is that you come because everything has already been prepared. Everything has already be made ready. And it's the exact same with God this afternoon. But do you know the sad reality? 
The sad reality for you and I so often is that we, instead of coming and just sitting and enjoying what God has for us on the basis of what God has done for us, do you know what we want to do? We want to roll up our sleeves, we want to get a penny on, we want to get into the kitchen in a sense, and we want to make some sort of additional preparation to what God has already done. And that is what all our, our, our religious activities are. They're like us saying to God, what you've done is not enough. What you have provided is not good enough for me. I need to add to that. I need to give in addition to that. Our charitable deeds, church attendance, good lifestyles, whatever it might be. We tag these on to what God has already done. But all the time God is saying, I've already done everything. I don't need you to come and put in your tuppence for I don't need you to come and slave over the cooker, as it were. I have prepared everything. Everything is ready. It's completed. It's done. And it's done in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's done in the work that he did on the cross at Calvary. And I'm just asking you to come on that basis. Come to me because I've made full provision. Full provision has been made in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we want to know God this afternoon, and if we want to have an experience of God and know him as our father, as we've been reminding the children of earlier on, then we come on the basis of what he has done. We come on the basis of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we hear the invitation of God to our hearts this afternoon as it rings out in the ears of these men that were invited to this great feast. Come! Come because all things are now ready. And the invitation was out to you this afternoon. To come. Come just the way you are. Just come with your burdens and your problems and your issues and your doubts and your difficulties. Just come. Just come because he has already made everything ready. The Lord Jesus Christ has done, done it all. And the invitation goes out to you today. An invitation not to come to a church building, but an invitation to come to God himself. As he says, come. The Lord Jesus Christ reiterated those, that invitation when he was here on earth, didn't he? The Lord Jesus Christ would say, come unto me. All you who are weary, all you who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And we can have rest this afternoon in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The invitation is for you today. The invitation is for each and every one of us. And I suppose this afternoon the key is how are we going to respond to that invitation? Are we going to accept the invitation? Are we going to come? And are we going to enjoy everything that God has for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we going to come and enjoy sins forgiven? Are we going to come and enjoy peace with God? Are we going to come and enjoy hope for eternity? Are we going to come and enjoy all the blessings that God has for us? Because we're coming on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And we're coming with an acknowledgement that our sin prevented us from coming in the first place. And it's only by what Jesus Christ has done that we can come because our sin has been dealt with. Our sin has been cleansed and forgiven. Or I wonder as you hear the invitation come. I wonder if you're like these individuals at the commencement of this parable. And as you hear the invitation to come, into your mind there floods excuses that prevent you from coming. And that's what we have. And we've all heard the invitation this afternoon. The invitation from God. Come. Come for all things are now ready. The invitation can't be made any clearer this afternoon. God is inviting you to come to himself. And God has done everything possible to make it possible for you to come to himself. Come. As you hear the invitation this afternoon, perhaps already in your mind, excuses. Excuses that are going to prevent you from coming. And here were individuals and that's the position they found themselves in. And they heard the invitation, perhaps even an invitation that, that you know, they had previously 
uh, decided that they would, they would accept. Perhaps when the initial invitation was given, when the date had been set, and you know, maybe at that point in time they had been, yeah, we'll be there. Yeah, no, I'll definitely turn up. And then as the, the time of the, of the feast is appointed, excuses come into their mind, and, and they refuse to come. And, and their excuses are rubbish, to put it bluntly. Their excuses are rubbish. One of them says, I've bought a piece of land, and I need to go and see it. You know, what idiot buys a piece of land without going and seeing it first? You know, I know some of you have been in the, uh, you know, in the position of trying to look for new properties and things like that. You know, you don't just look through a brochure, do you? And decide, you know, I'm going to buy that. And then once I've paid out, you know, X amount of thousand pounds for it, then I'll go and see it and see if it's really up to much. You go and view it, don't you? You go and see what it is you're getting for your money. You go and see if there's things that maybe, you know, maybe the pictures haven't quite identified. It's a rubbish excuse. And yet that was the type of excuse that this person was going to make when they're invited to come to this great feast. And do you know the reality is, the excuses that we make that stop us coming when God invites us to, invites us to himself are just as rubbish sometimes. When you wait up with all the blessing that God has for you, all that God wants to give you, the excuses that we make that stop us coming, when you think about them in the light of that, they're rubbish excuses. And here he was putting kind of material things before God. That's a danger, isn't it? It's a danger that all of us can slip into, isn't it? That, you know, material things become more important to us than God himself. And, you know, maybe it was the idea of, you know, I bought it and I need to go and look at it. So, you know, maybe there's a sense in which we've maybe been a wee bit harsh on the man because maybe he had looked at it before he bought it, but, you know, maybe now that it's his, he just wants to go and sit and look at it. You know what it's like when you get something new? You get kind of fixated on it, don't you? You just go back to look at it. You know, it hasn't changed from the last time you looked at it, but you just get drawn. You know, that's new. You go and look at it. Maybe that's the sense of what he was doing. You know, maybe he was just keeping going back to look at it. He was becoming consumed with material things. And he lost out in spiritual blessings as a result of that. His excuse was rubbish. And then the next person, he comes with his excuse that he's bought five yoke of oxen and he's going to go and test them. He's going to go and, and make sure they're actually fit for purpose. Uh, you know, it's a similar excuse, isn't it? You know, you, you would think it would make more sense to make sure the oxen are going to do what you want them to do before you go and spend the money on them. It seems to be a bit kind of topsy-turvy, the way he's done things. He says, I've bought these oxen, so I need to go and make sure they're actually worth the money I've spent on them. Instead of making sure they were worth the money before he spent the money. It's just a rubbish excuse. And again, it's just material things, isn't it? Material, temporal things that just consume us. We live in a materialistic world and we live in a materialistic age. None more so than the, the society that we live in. It's just so focused on materialism and possessions and wealth. That people go in for all of that. And again, for all that, the expense of the spiritual blessings that God has for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so there he is with a rubbish excuse. And then the next one, he says, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. You know, there was nothing to stop him bringing his wife home, was there? I'm quite sure this guest and all his generosity with all the expense that he'd gone to, I'm quite sure he could have made provision for this woman that was almost dear to the guest that he was inviting. But, you know, he says, I've, I've, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. You know, it was almost as if, don't even try, don't even try trying to negotiate with me. Don't even try trying to persuade me. It's not worth it. I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind. I cannot come. And he put relationships over God. And he says, don't try changing my mind about this. I'm quite set that I will not be coming. I cannot come. You know, I wonder is the relationships that we're putting above God, the call of God in our lives. And we're valuing that more than we value God himself. And we've made up our minds almost, we're resolute that we will not come. Don't try negotiating with me. Don't try and, 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 and plead with me. Don't try and compel me because my mind is made up, I will not be there. I wonder, is that your response this afternoon to the great invitation that God has given you? 
and, and you're holding material things and relationships above the call of God on your life. And these responses get back to the master that had provided this feast and the, the master's heart was angry. Can you imagine how it must feel to God this afternoon when he hears your pity excuses about why you won't come? When he hears the things in your life that you value more than him? Can you imagine what that does to the heart of God? And yet God is not going to just allow this feast to go to waste, is he? God is not going to allow the efforts that he has, he, has, he has gone into to provide for you and I in a means of salvation. You know, God is not going to allow that just to you know, disappear into thin air and no one's going to get the blessing of it because he says, doesn't he, to these, these, these servants, he says, right, he says, I want you to go out. He says, I want you to go. He says, I want you to get the blind and the lame, the halt and the maimed. Bring them in. Bring them in. You know, that's the type of people, isn't it, that are, that are in the heart of God. It's people that are broken. It's people that, that you know, didn't have anything to offer. You know, he's already challenged the people that he's, he's speaking to here. He's already challenged them about the type of people that they bring to their houses. And he's already said to them, you know, you don't just bring your friends and people that you go on with and people that can, you know, you, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back idea. People that you're going to get something out of. Don't invite friends that you know are just going to invite you back. He says, invite people that you know can't kind of give you anything back in return. Invite people that are poor. Invite people that are maimed. Invite people that are broken. And that is the type of people, we're thinking of this this morning, uh, when we remember the Lord Jesus this morning, we're reminding our hearts that that's the type of people that God was interested in. That's the type of people that the Lord Jesus Christ was interested in. He was interested in people that, that had nothing really to offer him back. Interested in poor people. The marginalised in society, interested in the blind people, the people that had nothing to offer, the maimed, the whole, the broken. These were the type of people that Jesus came for. And that hasn't changed. These are still the type of people that Jesus is calling to this afternoon. You might be sitting here saying, you know, look at me. I'm a broken specimen of humanity. What have I got to offer God? How can I enjoy a relationship with God? How can I take that sort of provision from God when, when, when look at me, I'm, I'm broken. I've got nothing to offer him. That's exactly where God wants you to be this afternoon. Because the truth is, that's where every one of us who have ever known God had to get to that point when we realised we had nothing to offer him. We came to God in our brokenness and our blindness and our lameness and our haltness and our maimed. And we came. It's interesting, the language that he uses here is he tells his servants, he says, go and he says, compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. You know, there was no way in which he was going to compel these people with their silly excuses, was there? And these people that he's seeking to compel now are not people that, they're, they're, they're not people that, that just don't want to be there. They're people that feel as if they don't deserve to be there. And the fact that he's compelling them, he's trying to make them realise how valued they are. And how much they're worth. And how much the master wants them at his table. And how much the master wants to provide for them. And he's got to compel them. Because they're perhaps sitting in their circumstances. Maybe the blind man sitting in his darkness. And the, and the maimed person sitting there lame. And the poor person digging about in their pockets with nothing to offer. And, and they're thinking, we can't come. We can't come because we've got nothing. And the master says, compel them to come in. Convince them, persuade them to come in. I'm not interested in what they've got for me. I'm interested in what I can give to them. Go and get them. Bring them in. Compel them to come in. And they go out and they bring in these people. And these people are more than happy to come and to accept the invitation that God gives. And sit down and enjoy the blessings that they can experience through God's gracious hand. And they come and they say, look, we've done what you've asked and still there's room. You know, I'm glad. There's still room. Still room as of this moment in time for others to accept the invitation that God has given. There's still room. What is it we sing with the children, isn't it? About the fact that there's millions in, but there's room for more. When we think about heaven, there's room this afternoon for you to respond to the invitation of God. There's room for you to enjoy the blessings that he has in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's room for you today. And they say there's still room. And he says, go out into the highways and the byways and the hedges and go and just, you know, just compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. And that is the heart of God this afternoon. God's heart is reaching out in love today. And he's compelling you 
to respond to the invitation that he's given you. Come, because everything's ready. I've done everything that needs to be done. The price has been paid in full. The debt of your sin has been cancelled by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Come, come to me. In your brokenness, in your blindness, in, in your lameness, in your weakness, just come. Just come. You know, I wonder this afternoon, what's going to be your response to the invitation? You know, we can't make the invitation any clearer. The youngest child in this room this afternoon has an understanding of those, that, that simple word, come, doesn't it? Just come. It's one of the first words we learn as a child, isn't it? You know, as you rest your little toddler against the, the sofa and you take a few steps back and you put out your arms and you say, come, and you see them taking those first few steps, relying wholeheartedly on you, reaching out to you. It's no different. God is holding out his arms today and he's saying, come, everything is ready. Don't make stupid excuses this afternoon. Don't make excuses that only worth a penny. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Take him at his word. Accept him just the way you are. You know, the sad reality is that we come to the end of that passage and all these other people are blessed. And, and sad to say, in verse 24, these sad words, I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste of my supper. You know, I trust that is never going to be said of anyone in this room. Because you've heard the invitation today. I trust you have heard the invitation from God today. You've heard the invitation. Don't make excuses. Because the sad reality is you could make an excuse today and God could say you'll never taste my supper. You will never experience the blessing that I have for you. You will never enter into the goodness of the provision that I've made for you in the person of my son because of your pity excuses and because you valued other things more than you valued me. Take it as a warning as we bring a little message to an end. None of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Father, we come into your presence and we just thank you.